everyone, welcome back to part two of my family history DNA series. Um, about a month passed between me sending out my sample and getting back my results, but it literally took me a whole year to finish making this video. So sorry about the delay, but keep watching to find out some interesting things. Last time I checked in, my DNA sample was traveling from Port Hope, Ontario all the way to Ireland. I'm a little late posting this, but December 2021, I got an alert on my phone, and lo and behold, my ethnicity estimate was available to view. So here it is, Scotland, 32%. England and Northwestern Europe 25%, Finland 16%, France 13%, Ireland 7%, Norway 4%, and Sweden 3%. Initially I was surprised by the 32% Scottish result, but turns out there's a ton of that on my mom's side of the family. If you click on the surprise by your Scotland result, you can actually pause to read this bit if you'd like. Um, I really like that if you click e each section, you get a description of each region and you can really go into depth with it. The 25% England and Northwestern Europe really didn't surprise me at all. I've forever had a very British taste in food and as a kid I had a bit of an accent. It was very elegant, like for example, instead of pants, I'd say pants. And eventually I got forced into talking normal though, because I got bullied in school for it. Just a reminder again, feel free to pause the video to read any of these histories and descriptions. Now what did surprise me was the Finland result, 16%. Only 16%? My dad is literally half Finnish. I feel like it should be more than 16%. I've really been focusing on this portion of my family history more. Um, before my DNA test, I had hit a bit of a dead end or brick wall with my research, but I must say it has really opened up some doors for me and I've made quite a bit of an advancement researching the side of the family that's from Finland. Besides doing family research on the Finnish portion, I've also been doing cultural research and I must say I've really enjoyed looking up different recipes and foods that they eat there. Now, France, 13%. This is another one that caught me by surprise. This is also how I learned that my grandmother, who I look a lot alike, was part French and her main name was Ayette. There was a wee bit of French on my mom's side as well, but 90% of it is from my grandma Wickman, whose ancestors were from Quebec and before that, France. A couple of French locations mentioned multiple times throughout my family tree is Britannia or 
Brittany, France. Roan, France. And sorry if I butcher this. Kamaraska, Quebec. I was a little disappointed that I turned out to only be 7% Irish. I thought it would be a much larger amount than that, but I guess the Scottish percentage makes up for it. Something that keeps coming up in the histories of the UK ethnicities especially is the Vikings. I've been thinking of sewing a Viking dress for quite some time and I'm not going to lie this has inspired me to start sewing it a lot sooner. Norway and Sweden were definitely a surprise for me. I knew some of my ancestors were from Finland, but I, however, didn't know about any neighboring countries. I am looking forward to delving deeper into that, as I wonder if it's something to do with immigration. Like, I know my branch of the family tree immigrated to Canada, but I'm wondering if someone else in another branch immigrated to a neighboring country from Finland. Now these are the communities that I matched with. The Canadian Maritime Acadians are again thanks to the French branch of my family. I had quite a fun time researching the Acadians and their history. I found out that I had some Acadian ancestors that lived in New Brunswick in the 1800s at the time of bad harvest of the Madawaska settlement. My fourth great grandfather, Jean Baptiste Ayette, was listed on the list of sufferers of bad harvest. The New Brunswick provincial government sent Thomas Bailey, the surveyor general, to the settlement where he had found a dire situation. He had a list drawn up in August 1829 documenting those households who were in need the number of members of each household, and the amount in bushels of corn provided to each of them. In addition, on Ancestry, I found a journal entry that stated basically, before the corn was provided, the settlement divided up among them what turnips had been harvested, and other than that, they had been eating seagulls to stay alive. The seagull portion disturbed me a little because what do seagulls taste like? They're a protected species, so I'll never know, but would they taste like a dirty chicken? I'll probably never look at a seagull the same again. The southeastern Quebec French settlers community is also, I think, another one linked to my grandma's portion of the family. I have not delved too deeply into that part. Um, but when researching the Acadians, I did borrow two books from my local library that were very informative. One was The Acadians, A People's Story of Exile and Triumph by Dean Job. And the other one was a cookbook called The Acadian Kitchen, Recipes from Then and Now by Alan Boss, the Kilted Chef. There were some very good recipes in that book.
The New York settlers community was something that shocked me. I did not expect to have many American relations, but it seems there's a branch on my mom's side of the family. Um, this branch is from New Rochelle, New York. Uh, this European settlement was started by refugee French Protestants in 1688 who were fleeing religious persecution in France after the king's revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Many of the settlers were artisans and craftsmen from the city of La Rochelle, France, thus influencing the choice of the name New Rochelle. My seventh great-grandfather, Moses Clark Sr., was born in New Rochelle, New York in 1732. He later went on to grow up and marry a Catherine Coutant, who was a descendant of one of the original settlers of New Rochelle. Eventually, sometime in the 1800s, my fifth great-grandfather, Captain William Clark, immigrated to Prince Edward County, Canada, probably sometime during the Civil War. His son William would later settle in the Peterborough area, and that branch of the family eventually leads to my nana's, whose maiden surname was Clark. The Southern Ontario settlers, however, were no surprise to me because I knew quite a majority of them settled in the Peterborough area in the 1800s. My six great-grandparents were Robert Reed and Maria Louisa Stewart. Maria was Sir Thomas A. Stewart's sister, making Thomas and his wife Frances the probably two of the most prominent pioneers of the Peterborough area, my fifth great aunt and uncle. In June 1822, my six great grandparents, Robert Reed and Maria Louisa Stewart, along with Sir Thomas A. Stewart and Frances, they all immigrated to Canada. And once settled in the Peterborough area, Robert and Maria's daughter Mary would later go on to marry Samuel Strickland, the brother of Susanna Moody and Catherine Partrail, some more prominent pioneers of the Peterborough area. Samuel is my fourth great uncle, and I must admit I've read all of Catherine, Susanna, and Samuel's published works, and in my opinion, Samuel is by far the best author. I do admire Catherine's writings, but there's something about Samuel's book, 27 Years in Canada West, that just seems magical. Another door that opened for me after my DNA test was I found my great-grandmother's information. Growing up, I knew the story that she was Native and taken away to a residential school, and her and her siblings were separated for many years, especially after they were adopted out into different families. What I did not know, however, was how sad that story would be. My great-grandmother's name was Iva May Myers, and her adopted surname was Hilton. Iva's father's name was Reynold Francis Myers, and her mother's name was Margaret Maria McWilliams. Margaret was a descendant of the Peterborough Pioneer Reed family, as my fourth great-grandmother was Ellen Margaret Reed, Robert and Maria's other daughter, and Mary Reed Strickland's sister. Reynold, however, was native, and there was not much information to be found about him. An excerpt of Catherine Partrail's writings about the local natives always makes me think of him change of habit from the old outdoor life of the hunter trapping and preying upon them. They die under the restrictive laws of civilization, and in another century it will be asked where is the remnant of the native race, and but the dark eye, black hair, and dusky skin may be traced in a few scattered individuals. It may be doubted if they ever existed or had any descendants left on the land. And you know what? Because of so much lack of proof to the family story, I had doubted it for quite some time. Iva's mother, Margaret McWilliams Myers, died of typhoid fever at the age of 34 in 1905. Unfortunately, sometime between Margaret passing away and in the three years 
before Reynold passed away, the children were removed from his care. Reynold passed away in 1908 of tuberculosis at the Toronto Free Hospital for Consumptives. And basically, if you were native and you ended up in one of these sanatoriums, you never made it out alive. And that's correct. He never did. Thanks to finding this information, though, I found the extended family history of the Reed family, and that's how I realized there was Scottish on my mom's side of the family as well. The Reeds were descendants of the Stuart family of Scotland. I was able to trace it back many, many generations, and after much royal family history and such, um, I've traced it back at least to the 1300s, which is amazing. But that's an explanation for another video and another day. Thanks for watching!